Así que empezamos con la entrevista a Matt Davis, co-director del Car of the Year Awards en el Auto Show de Nueva York. Well, I'm now here with Matt Davis, uh, the co-chair for the World Car of the Year Award, who uh, we just uh, saw in New York handed out the prizes for uh, Audi, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, and Porsche, a uh, clean sweep for the Germans. So how are you, Matt? I'm doing very well, Javier. How are you? Excellent, thank you. So as uh, we were saying in New York, at the end of the awards for the World Car of the Year, Um, the process has started already, a clean sweep for Germany. So let's talk a little bit about that because I think it, it was a, quite a surprise in some uh, categories, right? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you couldn't help but notice that it was a clean sweep for Germany this year. And it's funny because after every time we give out the awards, there's sort of a debrief meeting with the steering committee at the show a few hours after. And uh, a couple of people in the steering committee said, you know, oh, man, this is a disaster. This is just... And I and three others basically said, what's the disaster? The message that this sends is that the Germans are doing their homework and they're doing cars that thrill us and are also practical and are also desirable so they win awards big surprise yeah so for the audience who has not uh, uh is not aware for of the awards uh, let's say uh, the audi a3 the new sedan won for in general the general category right yeah it won the overall world car of, car of the year for 2014 it was the a3 against uh, the other two finalists so the mazda 3 and the Help me now. The BMW, the, the, the BMW, BMW 4 Series. Four. Yeah. yeah. The, the 4 Series. So then, um, then the BMW yeah. i3 won two categories, green and design. Yes, it did. And Mercedes-Benz, the S-Class for the luxury, new new category for the awards, and then the Porsche 9, 911 GT3, very controversial, yeah. I guess. Yes, yes. Uh, performance. Yeah, so um, I can talk to those if you like, sure. Uh, the... Um, The two controversial ones, uh, the first one was uh, the i3 in design because uh, it's hot and cold for people. Um, I love it. Uh, for what it's meant to be, it absolutely embodies what that future vision of mobility is supposed to be. It's supposed to think out of the box and challenge you. And for what it has to do, it functions perfectly. So it's not just a fancy design piece. It also, it's all about function. So the design experts whittled it down to those final three, and then the whole jury of 69 people world, world, worldwide voted on it. So it wasn't just a matter of one person picking it and saying, I like it. 69 jurors exactly. decided that that one won, so it's legitimate. The other legi the, the other true controversy was the 911 GT3, as you said. Yeah. And that's because uh, that 3.8 liter engine had a supplier part That was defective and resulted, I believe, in three recorded cases of the GT3 burning. So, not good press. Yeah. But and, and we already had essentially established those final three for a little bit of a little while, and so I was the one who brought it up in the steering steering committee that I was a little uneasy with the GT3 representing us in the final three, etc. Given the fact that all the drama was happening. Yeah. And. Finally, we all discussed it, and I ended up agreeing with the idea of keeping it. Because in every test that's happened, and there have been tons of them, in comparison tests, etc., the car has been spectacular and perfect. So the fact that these problems happen is very unfortunate. But Porsche did its homework about how you do a recall, and they recalled all of them right away. That's what I heard. Gave them a free new engine and one more year on the overall car warranty, which is a huge mea culpa on their part. Uh, so that counts for something, too. So we left it in, and it won. Yeah, exactly. So in, in that regard, uh, and the, the recalls, I mean, so many things to talk about, really. And the recalls, I mean, things happen. I mean, the, the, uh, people have to understand that the brand puts out a car, but there's like hundreds of suppliers, right, to put it together. So something can go yeah. wrong. Oh, it absolutely always does. And we think of the Germans as they think of themselves as somewhat perfect. And when these things happen, um, they have a way of responding that is pretty amazing. They'll they'll do everything at all costs to fix the situation and make it right. Um, 
I think that's easier for them to do it versus a General Motors since that's on everybody's minds right now. Exactly. The problem. Uh, because they are smaller companies and they invest a massive amount of money versus any other nation's companies in public image, in customer service, in how people perceive them and the premium image. And so when a problem happens that's really serious, they handle it very seriously. Uh, so we give them points for that. Yeah, to sum up then, uh, 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 again, like a clean sweep for Germany, I mean, that's part of it too, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, the overall feeling, but it depends on the mar market you're in, leftover from the 1970s and 80s, some of the Germans, especially in North America, get a bad reputation. Exactly. Because they... They really deserved it, too, because back then, they were pretty bad. Um, but nowadays, they're really kind of second to none. Yeah. And so if you go on a bulletin board or something like that online and you hear someone bad-mouthing Volkswagen especially, bam, 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 uh, or BMW or Audi haters, it's probably because they still think it's that way from the 1980s or whatever, and it's absolutely not. They invested billions yeah. in in all aspects of customer relations and product quality, and it really shows. Yeah, and in general, there's, to, to be completely honest, at least here in the United States, there are not bad cars. I mean, like in, in no, some... Con actually, the Passat for North America is a better car than the Passat for the rest of the world, exactly. including Germany and Europe. It's a fantastic car in North America, so it's... Uh, It's it's a it, it deserves the sales success that it has had for certain quarters of certain years. Yeah. It, it's done very well. Yeah, exactly. So, Matthew, let's move on for 2015 because the process for electing the new World Car of the Year award has started, and it might be another German sweep <laughs> with one well, car, that the one you're driving now. The, the Germans are amazing. Yeah, we're driving the BMW i8 right now, and uh, we're the first group doing it, and we just drove through the. the the coastal canyons, the famous coastal canyon roads in California. And so we did a lot of sport mode driving. We did a lot of uh, city driving and uh, sort of uh, e-drive, which is pure electric driving. The car uh, is remarkable because, to be honest, honestly, the, the I-8, and speaking of that car in particular, they could have come out and charged way more money than they are asking because what everyone's doing with their halo car right now especially the europeans i mean look, look, look at the prices on these halo cars that are coming out yeah you know, one million 1.2 million yeah. they, they could have come out and probably asked even though it has a three-cylinder engine in the back which some people will probably look at and go wow and have their opinion but trust me the, the lightness of this car the rigidity of the car and the electric mobility of the car It just is a little rocket, zero to 60 in 4.3, 4.2 seconds. So it's a pretty remarkable piece of work and very future thinking. And uh, it's a complete car. It's also comfortable. Yeah, so, exactly. So that and, car... And they're charging, you know, 140,000 U.S. dollars for this car. Yeah, com compared to uh, almost a million from a 1918 Porsche Spider. <laughs> that... Exactly. I mean, they don't really compare totally, but the idea of the I car know. and the halo quality of the car... They actually could have charged about two hundred and fifty thousand, and probably still sold the car. Yeah, exactly. So that car, we first saw it a few years ago in Mission Impossible 4, and now it's a reality. And so uh, I was uh, talking to some people in New York, like that car could be car of the year, design of the year, performance car, and green car of uh, the year. No. I, mean, <laughs> I highly doubt it because I, I frankly think you know it depends on uh, uh, you know on how we all end up feeling about some variants of the new Ford Mustang. For no, oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we keep on looking for American cars that can qualify properly and compete head to head in the World Car Awards. We really uh, we, we don't have a bad opinion about American cars. No, just they don't they don't satisfy the criteria frequently. Uh, the, the the Corvette Stingray came very close this year in the breakdown of votes. It came very close. Uh, to the ultimate one of the GT3. So, and, and it might have you know, been a problem uh, in terms of GM making that car available for other jurors in other countries, you think, too? Yep, it, that was exactly the reason. If, we leave, if you look at the breakdown of the votes that happened from guys and, and women who got their butts into the car on the jury, um, <laughs> those who got in the car 
frequently voted it number one out of their top five. Very so unfortunately, not enough of us were able around in obscure parts of the world to get into a Corvette Stingray. And that's part of what the American manufacturers absolutely have to work on, is getting jurors into those cars sort of as an investment in their brand and see it that way and as being worth it. Because if you got in the Corvette, you probably would have voted it number one. Exactly. So we're talking to Matthew Davis, co-chair of the World Car of the Year Award, your panel. And Matthew, uh, I mean, it's a fascinating story. We can be talking for hours. I don't want to take too much of your time, but uh, can you tell our audience where can they find your, where you publish your, your stories? I, I know you li live in Italy and publish around the world, basically, right? Yeah, I, I still, for reasons unknown to me, I'm the only American journalist over there living and working in Europe at this level, and it's, uh, it still blows my mind because it's so much fun, and there's yeah, so yeah. much work, so it's great. But uh, you can see my stuff on the, in, in the United States. You can go to Yahoo Autos, or you can go to autoblog.com, and my stuff is all over those those places plus others, of course, but those are my two main outlets in the United States. Excellent. Thank you very much, Matthew, and uh, maybe I'm going to send an application to be your assistant there in Europe. Maybe <laughs> you can consider it. Give it a shot. Thank you, Matt. Okay, buddy. Bye, chao. Bye. Ya regresamos. Yo soy Javier Mota. Esto es Auto 060 aquí en Cristina Radio Network. Este programa fue una producción de National Latino Broadcasting.